Your week is not the same without worship, is it? Because that is why God created us, to worship and enjoy Him forever. The Westminster Catechism rightly proclaims that. So this morning's message is an interesting one. It is a very encouraging one, but it's not a common one. Because even though we're going to talk about the members of the body of Christ and what does membership look like, in our society today, people are not committed. The word authority, the word submission are very negative words in our culture, aren't they? People do not want to hear those, and they especially say in marriage, no, we don't use that word submission, we work as a team. Well, every marriage, a good marriage, will work as a team, but they don't believe in a leader in the church or a leader in marriage that actually has authority, completely contradicting what Scripture teaches, and yet these same people will submit to group membership as sorority, or a golf club, or a sports team. With no problem, they will submit to their coach, do everything the coach tells them to do, to a T. By the time you talk about anything of authority in the church's submission, people start to cringe. And a lot of churches don't even believe in membership, and sadly they lose a great deal of blessing by the Holy Spirit by believing that. Because even though it is not a pleasant term in our culture today, that word membership, the members of the body of Christ like Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 talks about, that is more easy to absorb. But the word membership can bring a lot of mixed emotion and even pain and hurt. And even at Tanya, one time at a church, Tanya told me to wait for membership. And we went, I went ahead because I didn't want to be disconnected. I wanted to be faithful to Scripture being a member of a local church, and in the end, it was a bad decision because as more time came out, the more I, we realized, Tanya and I both, even our children, started to realize this church is more pharisaical, more legalistic, more moralistic than really truly understanding the gospel, and we left. And so that word membership can bring all these mixed emotions, and here's what I want to tell each and every one of you. Though I believe clearly what Bible, the Bible teaches in, in being having a structure of leadership and membership in a local church, just like deacons and elders, there is a reason for that. There is an order of God. There is a structure put in place in Scripture. At the same time, I understand the resistance to that because of how much abuse that there has been of formality of religion instead of having a true Christ-centered church. So we all need to be clear on something. There are the formal Bible churches, evangelical-type churches that does not necessarily mean that they're Christ-centered churches. Does that make sense? So we have to pray and be a part of a church that is Christ-centered, not just has a Bible in it, or they say that they're evangelical. That doesn't necessarily mean they understand the gospel. And so for many of us, membership experiences have been really negative. They have not been enjoyable. There's more of a formal structure like that Baptist-type culture that I grew up in you knew where you sat in the, in, the, in the church. You stayed in that pew or in that chair the rest of your life. And there was a set structure put in place in that church, but it was a form of religion, but it denied its power. That is the power of the gospel alone to change us, not moralism, not being good or better people. And so I, I give this message uh, regarding membership a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but when you see what Paul teaches in the book of Romans, I think and I believe it's going to put your hearts at all at ease. Because you're going to see a difference with how our church believes and why we believe what we believe. And so the idea of membership or being part of a sports team or a club, especially a traveling team, again, is not a problem for our culture. That's what people love and they invest so much time and energy in things that don't matter. And I did research in the past, so this is legitimate research, on how much the average American family spends on sports travel teams when they're part of a club, whether it's football or volleyball, whatever it is. It's per year, per child, twenty to thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars And yet, parents will go through all of these hoops and jump through all these obstacles and their children to be a part of these club teams and will sacrifice so much time and energy and money but yet they would never do that for a local Christ-centered church. That's crossing the line. That's too extreme. That's too radical. But yet what I see in Scripture is that Jesus was radical. 
and he calls us to a radical life. What I see in the Apostle Paul, all the apostles, they were radical men. They gave their life for what mattered. And the more I study Greek and Hebrew, the more you see the words. And what we're going to talk about today is there are very strong words showing extreme dedication and extreme action that the, the word radical is equivalent to the word of being a true Christian, being truly born again. And all my life, I have heard people call me radical and extreme as a Christian. Heard that from so many people inside the church, not outside the church, Outside the church, like, oh, man, what did you do in Nicaragua? What did you do in Peru? What did you do in Colombia? Oh, man, that's so cool. And yet the church will, exo- will, will elevate missionaries, but in terms of being confronted by those missionaries, oh, you're crossing the line. You can go and be extreme in Africa, but I don't really want you to be extreme here because you're messing up my hair. You're making me very uncomfortable because it's fine that you're like that, but don't bring that to Bozeman, Montana. And I'm sorry, but it will be brought to you. Because that's the truth of the gospel. So the more you study these words in the original language, they're actually more powerful in the original Greek than they are in English. And sometimes they're more powerful in Spanish than they are in English. They hit home closer. And so that's why this is so important to get at the heart of what the gospel is and get a heart of what membership is. Because you need to know something statistically, and you can research this on your own. Churches that do not have a membership versus churches that do, show a stark contrast in the maturity and the dedication and the commitment of its members, of the people that actually go there every Sunday. The people that could be the same people going there every Sunday, but there is a stark difference between those that went through a membership process that have that formal commitment and those that just see it as something lighthearted, informal organization they attend when it's convenient. Those people never grow. They will stay the same way for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Their marriages stay the same, and their, church, their children end up not really caring about God at all. We live in a very uncommitted society, especially to the church. People actually believe that I can love Jesus and I can be spiritual without being dedicated, committed to the local church, a Christ-centered church, and they are completely 100% mistaken and probably not even born again. Because I cannot separate Jesus from his church. That would be, and I've used this illustration before, that is the same as saying, Jared, I can be a super good friend with you and not have any interest in getting to know Tanya or ever spending time with her. If we're married, we're one flesh. That's never going to work. And if that is your attitude, there is no way you are a friend to me. And there is no way I would accept you as a friend to me. Because you deny my own flesh, and that is my spouse. No one would accept that, but why do we accept it in the church? So what pastors have done in the past 30, 40, even 50 years is that because people don't want to be committed to anything, do you know what they do? They say, oh, that's an easy solution. I'll just be more of a corporate executive, and I will lower the standard for everyone and make it entertainment driven. We will no longer give hard messages. We will make everything enjoyable and entertaining so that people feel warm fuzzies, and they'll want to come back to our church because it is so exciting and it makes them feel so good about themselves, you need to be very clear, and I need to make myself very clear, that what the Bible teaches is very black and white. You are not here to feel good about yourself. You are here to feel good about the Lord Jesus Christ and his glory and his beauty. And you are going to see his beauty in his church, even though there's a lot of ugliness in church, isn't there? And we're going to also see the main reason why people do not, listen to this please, do not want to make a commitment to a local church and be faithful and become actual members of that church, do you know what I believe is the number one reason? Unforgiveness. A lot of times they have so much deep hurt from their parents or from childhood trauma, suffering, rightly so. But as they get into adulthood, they transfer that onto the church. There is, no un, there is no forgiveness truly in their heart, and so they protect themselves. I'm never going to be transparent. I'm not going to commit to a local church where people are going to pry into my business because I do not, cannot handle being hurt again or being betrayed, so I'm not going to even get close to them. The root of bitterness is already in their heart, and they can't even see it. That is a serious problem. And so what this passage teaches us is intentionality, and it teaches us intensity. So let's look at it, Romans 12, 
9 through 13. Only five verses. Romans 12, 9 through 13. You all remember we talked about the first section of this chapter, talking about the spiritual gifts and renewing our mind and being a living sacrifice. And after the spiritual gifts and descriptions, it, it leads into verse 9. It says, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. That means hate. Some of your translations will say hate. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. And seek to show hospitality. There is, this part is positive, And the rest of the chapter goes into a more negative reality of the Christian life of enemies and vengeance and all of those kind of things. But in the first part, it is the positive of what we are to be about and being intentional in. And so, easy, five verses go through a structure of your life, your church, your service, your challenges or tribulations, trials, and lastly, your economy. So the first is let love be genuine. Let love be what? Genuine. That goes to tell us that a lot of love is what? False, is it not? It's not real. Remember the sermon, I'm going to keep repeating it, that there is most of the quote-unquote evangelicals here are very nice people. Well, not always. But they're usually nice, but they're not generally kind. Kind people love genuinely, authentically. They tell you the truth because they love you. Love that is not genuine tells you what you want to hear but there's no genuine concern of that person about your welfare. Whether you're successful or not means nothing to the person. They only care about themselves and their family. Their well-being, not your well-being. That is not true love. That is false love. If you're part of a Christ-centered church, not evangelical because we don't like that term because that's culture, that's sinful. The Bible church or the Bible belt culture, that does not come from Scripture, so we don't use that in Petra Bible Church. Does that make sense? Well, we have to. Because it comes from the word evangelios. That's not, it, it, that's why we say evangelical. Once you add the isms, even evangelicalism, you come with the corruption of man. That's why we are a Christ-centered church. A Christ-centered church loves genuinely, it hates what is evil. Can I write on this? Oh, it actually worked. Hate or abhor what is evil. So does that sound extreme to you? So on one side, a genuine love for Christ and the body of Christ, and on the other side, you don't just dislike abortion or sexual perversion, you hate it. So if someone doesn't hate abortion, then how can they be truly saved? There's Christian school teachers that are Democrats. I mean, Christian school teachers that are Democrats. Oxymoron! How can you support an organization, a group that willingly supports the killing of children and even pushing giving 28 days after the child's born for the parent to have that allotment of time whether or not they're going to kill their child. From 1963, they were pushing that, that 28-day rule. Not just five years ago, not just a year ago, 1963, they wanted to implement that. We are to hate pedophile in all of its regards. We are to hate the the taking advantage of any child under any circumstances. That is to be hated with a passion. So we are to love genuine, love real, that which is good. It says hold fast. It's the Greek word, the, the, the basis of that, the root is glue. It's something fixed together, sealed. You are to hold fast to what is good. That means protecting innocent life is good. We cling to that. We don't just, oh, yeah. It's good to protect life, the elderly and the unborn. No, no, no. It's a passion. Everything which is good, which is of God, should be passionately committed to. You should cling to that. As the Greek word says, hold fast, hold fast or cling, it means glue. Love one another. Remember that, that, sh that piece of paper that you have in your bulletin? That out of, made out of cardstock is all the, the love and one another passages, this one, and there's really important questions on the back for each and every one of you. There's 36 of those. So you cannot obey scripture without being part of a local church. It's impossible. One another, 
36 times to forgive one another, love one another, confess to one another, serve one another. It's all through the New Testament. With what? Brotherly affection. That's why we hug in this church. Because in the Greek word, it means the same love that you would have for your brother and sister biologically. You should have that same kind of affection for people inside the church. That's why during COVID, we made a rule that you can't hug twice, only once. Because we are scientifically accurate. And when anyone says it's scientifically based, you know they're lying. They don't even know what science is because God created the world in six days. Period. There's no such thing as theistic evolution. Any Christian says they're a Christian, believes in theistic evolution, they are not born again. They don't know scripture. It's a blasphemy against God to believe in theistic evolution. 110%. This church is never going to hold to that by God's grace. This love, the brotherly affection, is that you genuinely, when you hug that person in the church, you genuinely love that person. You're not here for yourself. You're here for that other person. That's what a Christ-centered church is all about. You really believe the love of Christ is real, but we're going to talk about something. If there is not something in your life, you will never get to that point of brotherly affection. Outdo one another. How many of you are competitive? Raise your hand. Because like almost our entire first service raised their hand. There's less competitive people here. Outdo one another in showing honor. Oh, you first. No, no, you first. No, no, go, you go first. And then you're still standing there 15 minutes later. That's not exactly what it means. But it's not honoring ourselves. It's making sure that everyone else is honored. That is a, one of the coolest games you could ever play. Just like when you grow in wisdom and like, I want to be the wisest person in this place. I want to be one of the wisest person for God's glory in my entire family. That's an exciting game, isn't it? That's motivating. It is also motivating to desire to outdo one another in showing honor. Because you don't care about your own glory. You don't care about your own kingdom. You care about the welfare of everyone else in the church. And that gives you the greatest joy you could possibly imagine. Do not be slothful in zeal. See, in our culture today, they don't like authority words. They don't like submission words, even though the Bible has them a lot. They also don't like this word, lazy. Growing up in our generation, World War II generation, laziness was one of the worst things you could ever do. Now, it's completely accepted. Oh, I just need my me time. Your me time is just your lazy time. It has nothing to do with loving others. You're just loving yourself and being lazy. That's why Paul says, do not be slothful. That's an imperative. Do not be slothful in zeal. That means you should be zealous, fervent in spirit. Do you know what that means in Greek? It means to be on fire. And so our messages should be given in fervency with zeal, not slothful. Turn with me to Romans 14. And we're going to read these verses. That's slothfulness. And people accept that in so many churches as, well, he's just a chaplain. That's what we pay him to do. No, you're paying him to be dead. But you're not paying for what Scripture actually teaches to be alive to have a fire in you, and whatever God calls you. Remember those spiritual gifts that we talked about the last couple weeks, and your personality as well. It is to be on fire. You're to serve in Petra Kids, or you're to serve cleaning the kitchen, or cleaning the bathrooms, or praying upstairs in zeal. You are fervent. You are not dead, even if it's negative 15 degrees out. You are alive. There is a fire in you because you know what you've been saved from. You know how wicked your sins are. That produces that gratitude, that fire in you, and that's how we are to serve the Lord. So it talks very clearly about quality, doesn't it? We don't just come to church and I'm going to serve in this area because I ought to do something, because I am a Christian, you know, and I am a member of the church. No, we don't want those kind of members at this church. You either have a fire or a zeal for Jesus Christ, or you are probably deader than you realize. We are to serve the Lord. Our quality matters and rejoice in hope. And remember your prepositions. We have to talk about these. And I don't care how tired you get of me talking about prepositions, but prepositions are important. 
Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope. And what is hope? Whenever Paul mentions that, he's talking about the gospel. You are saved from your sins. Jesus is coming to take you home. When you're going through challenges and trials, tribulations, your hope is not in people, it's not in the church membership. Your hope is not in your family. Your hope is not in the economy. Your hope is in Christ. And then it says, for that reason, you can be patient. If I'm not hoping in the gospel, I can't be patient in any tribulation. I just want it to end. And in tribulation, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting the root of that word and the history of it because it really is talking about lasting longer than what you thought it would last. It's going beyond the time frame that you thought it would take, oh, this tribulation is going to take a week or a month. And it takes like two months, six months, seven months, a year. That's what that word means. You were going past the allotted time that you thought that trial would take, and you were constant in prayer. And anytime I've gone through oppression or very attacked, very discouraged, even if it's for 24 or 48 hours, and I try to work my way through it and stay busy and get this work done, thinking that's somehow going to take away the oppression, and I look back, and because of trying to fight through that oppression and try to get the right perspective, I look back and almost every time, the time I actually spent in prayer is very limited. And so at times, why did that oppression last so long? Because I was not constant in prayer. I was trying to do all these other things in ministry or even Bible study or getting this or that job done, even ministry jobs done, but I was not being constant in prayer, and that's why the oppression felt so weighty and so heavy laden. And then the economy contribute to the needs of the saints. Those are the people we know inside the local church and seek to show, that is intentionality, seek to show hospitality, not like, oh, hey, brother, no one has anywhere, this family doesn't have anywhere to stay. Can you please have them stay at your home tonight? That's not what this is saying. Paul is saying seek to show hospitality. You are seeking to use the home that God has given you to bless other people. So that doesn't just mean stay the night or stay a couple nights. That means your home is always open to show hospitality. You seek that out. That is a desire for you. So for one, we talked about the, the spiritual gift of givers and generosity, and that is true. Some people have the gift of generosity of giving. But this is talking about all believers are to contribute to the needs of the saints, and that's part and parcel with hospitality. That is to show the love of Christ, not just Sunday morning giving people a hug and saying, how you doing, brother? It is showing the love of Christ at home. It's all of it combined. That is part and parcel of what it means to be fervent in your service to the Lord. This is for all saints. Here's what's so interesting. Most elders in the United States churches in Canada, are they chosen more based off of the biblical requirements of hospitality, or are they chosen more if they're successful and wealthy businessmen? Is anywhere in Timothy or Titus the requirements for being an elder of the church, does it have anything to do with being a successful businessman? But hospitality is a requirement of being an elder. Meaning if the man is not a hospitable man, he is not qualified to be an elder. These five things, your life, your church, your service, your challenges, your economy... They are all to lead us to have an abundance in our Christian life to truly grow and experience that joy that Jesus said is to be made complete. This is God's order. This is God's way. And this is what's most rejected, sadly, by our culture. Because even Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says this, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Jesus is going to come back, amen? While we are waiting for Jesus, we are to encourage one another to be faithful in church and be faithful to gather together because we get discouraged. Satan attacks, and someone goes through so many attacks, and maybe was really planning to be at church on Sunday, but gets so bombarded, especially Friday and Saturday, that they have no desire to wake up and go to church. They just want to sleep in, and they want to put their pillow over their head, and pretend like these problems don't exist. 
People need to be prayed for, and they need to be encouraged. That is the one, another, one of the one another passages, to encourage one another. How many of you like to be encouraged? Raise your hand. All of us need encouragement. There's no one out there, Lone Ranger, that doesn't need any encouragement. If he does or she thinks like that, they are totally in bitterness and hard-heartedness. They are already far gone. But for the normal person, in or outside the church, all of us need to be encouraged. How? Encouraged with God's truth. God loves us so clearly, and how does God love us? He loves us through the local body of Christ. When you are greatly discouraged and you get a text or you get a phone call or you get a knock at the door, and that brother or that sister feels that concern or that love and wants to bless and encourage you, is it that brother or sister or is it the love of God through the body of Christ? It's God who hears your prayers, who hears your cry for help, and responds by using the body of Christ to minister to your needs. That is the love of Christ. That's not just the person. That person is responding to the voice of God, but God is using his spirit to work and use the body of Christ to minister and encourage your heart, and all of us need that daily. You can be greatly encouraged today and after you leave this service and tomorrow or Tuesday morning, greatly discouraged, can't you? We go by sometimes the, the, the waves in the ocean. We feel up one moment and down the other. And you could think, well, am I bipolar or what's going on with me? Why am I so up and down like this? It's not just an emotional thing of women. Men do it too. Men are sometimes better at hiding it. But we all need that encouragement. And how is it to come through the body of Christ? Everyone using their spiritual gifts to bless one another. I just saw how God used a need, a true need in this church this week between Paul and Rebecca. And how God used Paul's mechanic abilities with Rebecca's need for a new car. And how God orchestrated all of that in his perfect timing is what God does. How many thousands, literally thousands of examples of how God has used people in this church to minister to our needs and us to minister to their needs. And how, as parents, there are certain things in our children that we know Tanya and I don't have, but there are definite spiritual, emotional, mental needs of our children. And God used someone in the church to minister to our son or our daughter at the exact time they needed it. We as parents knew what they needed, but we knew it wasn't us that had that. It had to be someone else in the church to say those words, to meet those needs, and God used the church to do what we as parents could not do. That's why God has designed his church to meet the needs of all of us and not leave anyone unattended or empty. Do you believe that God's design is so powerful and so great that he made his church perfect even though it's filled with a bunch of imperfect people? And again, I'm going to go back to this reality that I understand why so many people are hesitant to becoming members of a church because they've seen so much abuse, so much damage, and I likewise have seen it and suffered it. Not just as a man, not just as a single guy, but also as a pastor's son. I've seen it and I've suffered through it. It does not change the standard of Christ. That we are called to make a decision to be committed, even though we know the church isn't perfect and I'm not perfect, I am committed to building the family of God, the kingdom of God through this local church. <clears throat> Hebrews thirteen seventeen, the author says, obey your leaders and submit to them. Wow, two words that are really not accepted in our culture, are they? For they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for for that would be of no benefit or advantage to you. It'd be no benefit or advantage to who? The pastor or to you? To you. Those that have no desire to seek godly counsel, that do not want to submit ever to their pastor, even if they go to the church every Sunday, those are the ones out of 22, 23 years of ministry I've always seen suffer incredible consequences. And those people that are wise, that even smaller decisions like, Pastor Jared, I want your wisdom and I want you to please pray for me. I want your counsel. 
because not that I had all the answers, but because they did what God has told them to do, and the scripture came or something came in the moment, just even praying for that person, God gave the person the answer. And I saw a blessing after blessing after blessing fall down upon that person because they did things God's way and not the arrogant American independent way. No one needs to tell me what to do. I don't need to ask anyone's counsel. When it says to do it so that they can do their job with joy, not with groaning, I have been a pastor long enough to know what it feels like to do my job with that joy because people are so submissive and humble and have such great attitudes. And I know what it's like to groan because the person caused so much conflict and so much pain and was so rebellious and here, nice and even hugging or, or greeting one another with a big smile and upstairs in the conference room yelling at me because of their rebellion and anger against God. So when your pastors or the elders excommunicate a member or say that they're no longer welcome here, you need to believe it's for your own protection. Because sometimes people show one face to you but the demons come out when no one else is around but me, Pastor Nick. And I'm not joking. That's how serious of a level it gets. When it says to obey your leaders because they watch over your souls, you want your leaders to protect you from evil people, wolves that are coming in to destroy you or possibly hurt your children. Or do you want shepherds, elders that are strict and believe and take this job very seriously? And I almost would say, I almost take my job too serious because I feel the weight of that burden and I need the grace of God to carry that burden. And you need to understand something, that when someone has a true calling in ministry, they are burdened for their people and their spiritual welfare. This has happened to me not just dozens, but hundreds of times, and I'm not exaggerating. The Lord has woken me up at 2.30 in the morning, in general it's 2.30, to pray for people in our church by name, and to pray for our kids in certain areas. And I have fought the Lord on this many times. I don't learn my lesson a lot of times because I will be laying in bed, and it'll be five minutes going by. I know the Lord is calling me to get up and pray, but I'm so tired, I'm just going to pray like this, horizontal. And I know that I'll just pray a little bit and pray for these people I, I'm thinking about right now, and then I will fall back asleep. And an hour and a half goes by, and I'm still not asleep. And I get up out of my bed, I get on my knees, and I pray and cry out to the Lord and intercede for the people in this church and in Nicaragua and Colombia. And I have a peace in my heart. And I go back to bed and I fall asleep right away. People that pray for you like that, you need to listen to them. And not be wise in your own mind, in your own opinion, because God says that's being a fool. You seek godly counsel because you want it to bless you. you. You want it to be advantageous for you in your life and your future. So you seek the counsel of those that diligently bring the word of God to you and pray for you diligently because they love you, because Christ loves you. And he's loving you through them to protect you. Here's the amazing thing. So many people don't want to be protected. They don't think it's necessary. Protection is necessary. That's why we have the military, and that's why we have police. Amen? Protection is a gift from God, but so many people reject it. They don't want it. They think, I'm fine on my own. No, you're not. Nor am I fine on my own. I need to be protected just like you do. And we went through this in Nicaragua, five years of church planning. We had no one mature enough to be elders and deacons in our church. So all the attacks from people in the States and people in Nicaragua, um, I got it directly head on. And until God raised up the men, the elders, and the deacons, and then they started to protect me, and the attack stopped. And then once again, starting that whole process happening in Bozeman, Montana, once again, brand new church plant, not enough elders, deacons, men that, that have yet to be raised up because it's not time, because it takes a long time in church planning for those men to raise up, and I'd be getting the attacks directly over and over again. And even thinking about that last night, God clearly rebuked me and said in his, but it was wonderful, you know, don't you always love to get rebuked by the Lord? Raise your hand. He says, what? You're weird. No, no, no. You want the Lord to rebuke you because it's the most loving, sweetest thing ever. 
It's, it's wonderful, and it's like you get slapped in the face, and you're like, that was awesome. That was the best thing ever. And God did that to me last night, and he, and he spoke to me. And I know people, well, Pastor Jared's mystical. I've been accused by that by people here, by the way. But God does speak to you through your word, but he does speak to you. I'm not talking about dreams and revelations. I'm not talking about charismatic Pentecostalism. I'm talking about the goodness of God. When God spoke to me, a really short phrase, he said, Jared, don't you believe I can protect you, but I'm sufficient for you. Those few words from God change everything, don't they? It's all in God's timing, not in ours. It says in Hebrews 13, 24, Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. They were a true family of God. When you go from this section of scripture to verse 14, and it says, bless, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. And then it goes down to the, the difficulties, the sufferings, and, and saying that vengeance is God's, not mine, and that I have to bless and feed and, and give a drink to my enemies. All of that, how could I ever get from 9 through 13 to verse 14 through the end of the chapter if there is not one thing that creates the bridge? And that is unforgiveness and forgiveness. Forgiving all of my enemies, all those that have betrayed my parents, my life, my siblings, whoever it is, I must forgive because Christ has forgiven me of everything. It is the bridge that leads me to say, I can bless those that persecute and have betrayed me, even though I want to run a bulldozer over them. And I love the Psalms precatory prayers of David, praying God's wrath and fire and them, God to crush their bones and all of that. It's like, amen. In our flesh, we want to see justice done. But yet, even if we think I've gotten vengeance now and the justice has been served, our hearts are not okay. Because that poison is eating away at us. And it will continually eat away in us until we truly forgive and we recognize that most of us do have bitterness in us. Because no one wants to admit that. After all these years, no one wants to say, yeah, I have bitterness in me because it's such an ugly word. Think of all the ugly words in English language. That's an ugly one. Oh, you're just bitter. Like, who wants to hear that? And our culture doesn't like the word. Like, no one wears a t-shirt, I'm a very bitter person. No one would ever wear that t-shirt. No one would ever sell that t-shirt because no one wants to be known as a bitter person. We can see it on their face a lot of times, right? Right? There's like knives coming out of their chest at everyone. There's prickles everywhere. They don't say a word, but you're like, you're like, oh, and you start to run away because you can feel it in the ambience. Electrons are moving around and above your head, but no one accepts it for themselves. All these years, please listen to me, dear church. The ones that say, I have no unforgiveness in me, I have no bitterness in me, always have the most. Every time. Those that say, that have a healthy, whole heart, they will say, you know what, I I think there is stuff I need to forgive still, and I'm I'm in a continual process that God is revealing things of unforgiveness in my life and bitterness. Those are the ones that understand the gospel. They're not moralists. They're not saying I'm a goody two-shoes Christian, I I do everything right. They admit, no, there probably is some bitterness in my heart because here's the key test. If there is explosive anger in us, in any moment, whether the guy cut us off when we're going 65, and they cut us off and they're going 55, if only the guy didn't cut me off, I wouldn't have exploded and lost my temper. Usually, any kind of anger is a symptom to show there's bitterness in our hearts, and that's what we don't want to confess. Because no one wants to admit that. Yeah, I do have bitterness, because that's an admission to the fact that I do need the gospel. And that I'm not the sweetest, whole person. If you wore a t-shirt, you sold a t-shirt, like I'm a very forgiving person, and it was like big letters, would everyone buy that t-shirt? Like you would get more friends if you wore that every day. People would want to be your friend. It's like, wow, whatever I do them, they're just going to forgive me. It's like, that's a win-win for me. But no one wants that bitter t-shirt. But bitterness is so ugly. And I've seen beautiful people turn really into ugly people. Like, you're just ugly. Like, I mean, physically. It's like, what are you talking about? The bitterness has changed their face. And then people are like, so-so? 
physically looking, but they have a heart free of, of unforgiveness and bitterness, is like, wow. They like light up the room. Their face glows. There's like an aura over them. I'm just kidding. They're like, okay, he's crossing the line there. That unforgiveness will stop you from that genuine love. It'll stop you from wanting to be a part of any church. Because you will always hold the pain you've experienced against anyone new. They could be the nicest, most loving, kindest people in the world. You will hold it against them because that bitter spirit will judge them before they even have a chance to love you. You won't accept those love hugs. You'll reject them. I can feel it. People that have come here, and they've come here enough time that they think, I think I can hug this person now. They're not going to think I'm a, a psycho weirdo. And yet, you hug that person, you, you feel their resistance. You feel the, their muscles tense up. Unforgiveness. There's, there's a bitterness there that reveals itself physically. And so, don't just think, well, yeah, man, praise God that Pastor Jared is talking about bitterness because I think some of the people in this church are, are a little on the bitter side. I, I've, I can see that. That means you have it because you easily recognize it in others. Self-pity, bitterness, unforgiveness, they all go, the, go together like this. Is it pleasant to confess and saying, yeah, I, I do have some bitterness in my life, but in humility and in honor to Christ, I want it out of my heart. It's a poison eating away at me, and I know and I believe it will destroy me if I don't truly forgive. It's not, not pretending like what the person did wasn't evil, wasn't bad. That's wrong. No, no, no. What that person did to me was super evil, super wrong. There was no justification for what they did. It was pure evil. Amen? You have to confess that and then say, but Christ has forgiven me all of my sin against a holy, perfect God. I forgive that person's evil and wickedness. Now my love can be genuine. Now I can bless. And it says, bless twice and do not curse. I, in my flesh, prefer cursing. It's fun. It feels good after that person has done horrible things to you, right? In our flesh, that's what we want to do. And it puts us in a bondage. But when we can say, no, 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 I bless that person, and I'm going to make the best meal I can and give it to that person, drop it off their house, and not put poison in it, and I'm going to give a drink to that person that I know they like because we walked 20 years together. I know their favorite drink. And I'm going to give them a gift certificate to this place. And it's not a dark alley or anything like that. It's an actual nice place. Because I'm going to bless them, even what they did to me. That person is truly free. That is a process for all of us to do. But I'm here to tell you, and this is my personal opinion from what I know of Scripture and in ministry, that that is the number one per reason why people don't want to become members of a local church is unforgiveness. And it is wise not to ever want to be a member of a church, of a typical evangelical church that is Christless. You should never want that. We have done that, and we quickly evacuated because we saw there was not the gospel of Jesus Christ in that church. They taught the Bible really well. But in the end, it's what they didn't say. It was the underlining nonverbal rules and regulations and unspoken doctrine that you had to abide by. And if you didn't, watch out. They were going to destroy you, and we left that church. I'm not talking about those churches. You need to run from those churches. So I understand the cautiousness in your spirit, and that is right, that is wise, and pray about it. But when you know there is a transparency, there is an honesty, then there is nothing stopping you from obeying the word of God. Once God has provided that Christ-centered church, you are to walk in obedience in Christ. And you all know me. Do you think that doctrinal class and the values of our church on February 25th, do you think it's going to be a boring class? No, it's going to be a fun class, and rightly so. But just taking that doctrinal class and making sure there is believer baptism that is involved and there, there is a short application of, of explaining your testimony how you came to Christ, that is just normal because God is a God of order. And I want to tell you, all the core group of our church went through this entire process. 
I want to tol- tell you something. Those interview times with the elder and the church member have been some of my favorite times with the people of our church. And I've learned more about them. They've learned more about us or me during those interviews were times of weeping and of joy and of celebration and of excitement. Every single one of those interviews that happened. And in fact, I had a lot of interviews to do it once because we were trying to get everyone to, to be together at the same time. And every single interview I was excited about and filled my heart with joy. And so we're going to hear uh, a couple testimonies right now to end the service. Um, Elijah and Hananiah are going to share, and then um, Mariella is, is going to share. And, and poor sweet dear lady, I forgot to tell her, but she did a great job in the first service. I, for, I forgot to warn her. Uh, but I know that they're going to, all three are going to richly bless your heart right now. So please, Elijah and Hannah, come, come up and share with us. We've been coming to this church um, since April uh, 2021. And I can say it's uh, really blessed uh, my heart. And it's blessed my family. And we've uh, definitely seen and felt the fruit from it. Um, when we first started coming, I thought, oh, we just start going to a church. You know, I'm not going to do much with it, you know, we'll just sit down and listen to the sermons and check it out. And, um, but after, you know, coming for a while and seeing the, the love of all the members and, and uh, just the blessing in my heart and, uh, you know, showed me what uh, a God-centered, you know, true believing uh, church should be like after, you know, bad experiences with others. Um, I just wanted to, you know, do more and, and uh, you know, just be a giver and, and uh, bless other people like uh, I was blessed coming here. And, uh, yeah, it's really worked in my heart. Um, it's just the marriage stuff and blessing our marriage, um, marriage retreat and um, counseling and small groups and, and uh, going through forgiveness. And, and uh, it's... You know, just the way a church should be where everyone just cares for each other and there's uh, there's a brotherhood, it's a family, and uh, that's what church membership is all about, and um, that's what we wanted to do, and we just want to encourage you all to do the same thing and just use your um, gifts and your God-given talents to just bless other people and grow God's kingdom. <laughs> yeah, so like Elijah said, we started coming in uh, April 2021, and uh, I was more on the cautious side. I'm like, I don't know what we're getting ourselves into. Like, got to try it out before we commit too much. Yeah. Uh, I was kind of, I was raised with a family that went through like a lot of bad churches, so, and they still don't have one, so I guess that's where that came from, but I uh, actually just thought of this, I'm going to share it, I don't think anyone knows this except Elijah, so the third time we came here, the sermon that Pastor Jared shared like completely destroyed all of our way of thinking. <laughs> So we're really like faced with a decision. We're like, oh, do we keep going or, or do we uh, leave <laughs> and, and run? <laughs> we thought about. We're like, no, no, he's right. We need, we need to change. I think that was really from the grace of God showing us that, that without those. Um, <clears throat> like other irons and other members in the church, like showing you your um, issues, those things never come to light. So, yeah, I just want to encourage you all to sign up for the membership class and, you know, be a member and use your gifts to um, not just be selfish with them, but also, like, to serve on each other and, yeah, build this up as a family for Christ's glory. Yeah. 
No. <laughs> she, uh, she can speak fluently in English, but up front she wants to be translated, so that's fine. Sí. Uh, bueno, pues, uh, los, bueno, los que no me conocen, soy Mariela. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mariela. Uh, a los seis años, perdí mi mamá y crecí solamente con mi familia, uh, tíos y abuela. When I was six years old, my mom passed away, and I was uh, raised just with my aunt and uncles. Y siempre crecí con, con fa mucha falta de amor. Pensé que nadie me quería. And I grew up with uh, really a lot of lack of love, and I believed that no one wanted me. Uh -huh. Y de debido a eso, cometí muchos errores. But because of that, I committed a lot of mistakes. Y gracias a Dios, un día uh, orando, quebrantó tanto mi corazón. And that one day I was praying, and God was breaking down my heart so much. Y, um, Sentí tanto el amor de Dios y, y sentí que él me decía, hija, yo, yo siempre te he querido, siempre he estado ahí para ti. And then I felt God speak to me and say that he, he's always loved me and always wanted me. Y gra yo estoy muy agradecida con Dios por esta iglesia. Yeah, I'm uh, very thankful to God for this church. Sí, también crecí con mucha falta de perdón. And I grew up with a lot of unforgiveness in my heart. Y gracias a, a Dios, él ha confrontado tanto mi corazón. And praise God that he's confronted me so much. Y he sabido perdonar y, y, and I've learned how to forgive. Y pues muy agradecida con esta iglesia. I'm very thankful this church. <laughs> so I'd like you all to just please stand as I pray to dismiss us. And that if there is anything in your heart of unforgiveness or bitterness or anything that might be there, that you just pray and seek the Lord. Lord, if there is that anything like that in my heart, please show that to me because it takes a lot of courage, doesn't it? Pray that God will give you the courage to see what you otherwise would not want to see. Because remember, when the arm is broken so badly, it has to be rebroken by the doctor. No one wants that doctor to touch their arm. But that doctor has to touch the arm so that the bone heals rightly and that person can be made whole. So at this moment in time of praying, let God rebreak those arms that need to be rebroken. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would solidify and unify this church. Lord, we are imperfect. We are sinners. We make mistakes. But Lord, you are a loving, forgiving God. And that, Lord, that motivates us and should motivate us to forgive everyone in our life, Lord, no matter what they've done, no matter how deep the injustice goes. Lord, we can't have genuine love if there's bitterness in our hearts. We're going to defile everyone. So, Lord, please, may that not be true of this church. May we truly have a free heart and a free life. Hey, Lord, if there's any bitterness in me, any root of anger, Lord Jesus, that is formed out of bitterness, that it would be exposed, that it would be revealed so that it could quickly be dealt with. That, Lord, you would form up, Lord, strong families in this church that love you and desire to walk with you, Jesus, that desire to support this Christ-centered church. Father, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would free each and every one of us in this place. That, Lord, even before we leave, Lord, if there is a prayer that needs to be given, if there is a step that needs to be taken, Lord, may no one be hindered in that. They're saying, responding to you, saying, yes, Lord. Hey, this is very painful, but I'm going to obey your word. And I'm going to be transparent. I'm going to be courageous. And Lord, I'm going to believe in your goodness that you're going to heal my heart, but I need to obey your word. And so, Father, give me that grace right now to obey your word, follow your commands, to seek to do things your way instead of my way. And I know, Lord, you are going to richly bless my life. It's not going to be easy but it's going to be rich, it's going to be beautiful, it's going to be awesome to see what you do in and through me. To fulfill your promises in and through my life, I believe you, Jesus, that you're going to do it. And so, Father, Lord, I surrender all to you, all the hurt and the pain, all the unforgiveness and bitterness, I surrender it to you. Make my heart whole. Heal my life. Use me as an instrument for your kingdom. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We are just Thank you so much for watching Petra Bible Church Bozeman. We will have a new sermon uploaded each week for both English and Spanish services. And remember, hit like and subscribe. Thank you and God bless.